Welcome to the video on fossils. These are the outcomes for this video and we'll do some exam questions in class. So first of all we need to know how fossils actually formed. Now there's four ways that fossils can form and this is a summary of how they, they occur here. Two of them are very very similar. So if we look at this one where it says that the hard parts of dead animals that don't decay can turn to stone or become mineralised um, is very similar to having parts of an organism being replaced by other materials that then turn to stone. It's very difficult when you look at a fossil to tell which of these two it really is, whether it was the parts that were hard that turned to stone or whether some parts got replaced by materials that then turned to stone. Can't really tell the difference by looking at a fossil, but hard parts that have turned to stone. Then we can also get um, dead organisms where the conditions for decaying just aren't there. So we'll talk a little bit more about that later, but things that are preserved in ice are an example of this. And finally, sometimes the actual organism isn't turned into a fossil, but traces that it was there have been left behind and they fossilise. So footprints can be fossilised, burrows that animals have made, tunnels where roots have gone through the ground, they can all be fossilised too. OK, let's have a little look at more of these in detail. OK, so this is an example of a bivalve, which is a little animal that lives inside a shell, and it's a fossil. It was found in the rocks in Dorset, and over millions of years it's been turned by heat and pressure from shell to stone, once the animal inside it died millions of years ago. Now, I'm sure you recognise this type of, of bivalve shell. We've seen empty shells left by living organisms that have been around during our lifetime. So we know that these types of organisms still exist today. Maybe not exactly the same as this one. Um, maybe they are exactly the same and scientists will be able to look at this fossil and see how similar this shell that's fossilised is to shells that we find these days in various parts of the country, in various parts of the world, and find out how much these organisms have changed over time. Now, these organisms have come from the sea, and it tends to be that organisms that live in the sea don't change all that often, um, don't change that much over even millions of years. Um, and that's something that's quite significant because life underwater hasn't changed all that much. So the organisms that live there haven't changed that much. So we can see from these types of fossils just how little some of the life on Earth has changed. These are some more examples of other things where the hard parts have been turned to stone. And we've got a shark's tooth here and a piece of turtle shell a piece of jawbone, and I think this is either a claw or a tooth um, embedded in the rock still here. All of these things are hard parts that have turned to stone um, over millions of years. And again, scientists can look at these, compare them to what there is around today, compare them to other fossils and find out how much or how little life has changed. OK, this example is where the conditions for decay are not there, okay? So decay requires three things. It requires oxygen, it requires warmth, and it requires moisture. And if you're missing one of those things, decay won't occur. We know this from real life because when we preserve food, we either remove the oxygen or the warmth or the moisture. And that's why freezing things works to preserve food. It's why drying things out preserves food. Um, we can also change the pH and make the pH so extreme that the enzymes won't work um, to, to decay anything. And that's why things like pickling works. Now, most things aren't pickled um, to cause fossils to form, but there are some examples we'll have a look at that have oxygen or warmth or moisture or all three or two of those missing. And that means that the decay won't occur. Now, these insects are really lovely examples and people buy these um, either as ornaments or sometimes even as jewellery. Um, amber is the sticky tree sap um, that's oozed out of a, a tree millions of years ago. An insect has become caught up in that blob of amber and got caught inside it. And because there's no oxygen in there 
and there's no moisture in there, it's stayed preserved as the tree sap has hardened over time. Even though the conditions might have been warm, bacteria could not get to that insect to decay it. So instead it's been preserved and the tree sap has hardened into a substance that we call amber and is used for jewellery. Here are some more examples of things where decay couldn't happen so the organism was preserved. Up at the top there's a baby woolly mammoth. Um, you can see how well it's been preserved. You can see how much of it's still, still intact. And they can obviously find huge amounts out because it's not just the bones that are there, not just the hard parts, but the soft parts have been preserved as well. Um, a little animation of how they could reconstruct a saber-toothed tiger here um, because sometimes they were found in ice as well. And down here on the bottom right-hand corner, you can see a human who's been preserved. Now, this is something that's happened a few times. They've dug in peat bogs. Peat bogs are a specific type of, of soil, if you like. Um, not quite a proper soil, because it's so acid and so waterlogged that there's no oxygen there, and the acid doesn't allow bacteria to do any decaying. And you get whole people who are preserved. And you can see that the skin has turned to kind of like a leathery colour. They go a red colour um, because of the effect that the, that the acid in the ground has on their skin. Um, but they're perfectly preserved. They've found prehistoric people who've been buried in peat bogs and they've been able to dissect out and find out what they ate for their last meal, found the contents of their stomach, seen what berries and nuts that they'd eaten before they, they died. Um, really interesting what they can find out from these because obviously it's like I say it's not just the hard parts that are preserved but the soft parts too and that means we can find out so much more about what these things look like even from thousands or millions of years ago. Finally, we need to look at how we can have fossils of imprints, trace fossils they call them, um, imprints left behind by living organisms. You can have footprints, and this footprint here that's got the ruler next to it um, is actually from Formby, and 6,000 years ago there are evidence that humans walked along there. Now for some reason the ground that they walked on was covered over and preserved and has been turned to rock. Uh, a bit like if you walk through wet concrete, but for some reason those footprints were undisturbed and they can find out a little bit about how tall the people were and how fast they walked by the size of their footprints and the gaps between their footprints. They can see if there were groups of um, adults walking together or adults and children walking together. They can try and work out what they might have been doing there. Um, you know, were they looking for food? Were they, were they looking for berries? Um, were they dragging an animal behind them? You know, there might be traces of, of an animal being pulled um, that has been killed. Um, loads of information you can get, especially about humans, if you can find these trace footprints. But not just, obviously, of humans. You can see animal tracks. And then you can see in this bottom one, you can see outlines of plants. You can find out a little bit more about the plants that were living there um, because the imprint that it left... So although the plant hasn't been fossilised the imprint that it left behind has been fossilised, which is great. This is a really fabulous example. You know, who wouldn't want to find dinosaur footprints? Um, and again, you know, trace imprints, walked along, nothing messed around with those footprints. They were covered over and over millions of years, fossilised footprints. So, in summary, we can see that we get fossils from hard parts of organisms that have turned to stone or parts where the organism has been replaced by some other material during those millions of years and those bits have turned to fossils, they've turned to stone. We can have imprints that have been preserved and the ground has been turned to stone, preserving the footprints in it. And finally, where conditions for decay are absent, either no warmth or no moisture or no oxygen, or a combination of those, meaning that the bacteria that would normally do the decomposing, do the decay, can't work, so decay doesn't occur, and that means we get the soft parts left behind as well. Okay, we need to know why there aren't more fossils. Sometimes the exam questions ask this. 
we need to know that sometimes fossils are destroyed. They're formed, but before we get to find them, something has destroyed them. And let's make a list here of what those things could be. Also, sometimes fossils won't even form in the first place, and this is even more likely, that soft parts of animals that have died millions of years ago, thousands of years ago, are decayed by bacteria in the right conditions, warmth, oxygen, moisture. We're never going to find those being fossils because they got destroyed by bacteria acting on them and decaying them and rotting them away before they could even become a fossil. Okay, here's a summary of what you need to know about what fossils tell us. Well, we can find out what the animals and plants were like in the past. We can see then if there's anything similar alive today. And like we said with the bivalve shell, um, we can see that there are organisms alive in the sea today that look very like the organisms that were alive then in the past. We can also compare with other fossils and see if we can trace through the changes that happened to those organisms. We can find out what the environment was like around them. We can find out um, a little bit more about what they might have been feeding on by looking at their teeth. We can see what they might have eaten, um, especially if we can find those soft-bodied preserved specimens and we can find out actually what they'd eaten. Um, and again, what their lifestyle was like. Did they live in groups? Do we find fossils of them together? Um, or do we find them only ever on their own? Whereabouts in the world we find them? Where did they live? But most of all, and this is the real key thing that the exam questions usually want you to pick out, is how much or how little life has changed over time.